I always cry on my key adverts. Might that kill originality? If you do this in the business world, like this is criminal. You go to prison. If we can put a number on it. 60 billion is for the art market. Money laundering. Let's just reinvent it. I have yes. a 35 million dollar question for you. You just have to strike. Marine, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. But I'd like to go back um, to to the start, to the beginning, before you were we go, good a big person on the art scene in London. Rewinding back, what were you doing before, before your art career at 21? What was your life like back then? Okay. So I think to paint a picture, I come from a tiny island on the west coast of France called Ile de Ré. So there, there's actually more birds than people on this island. It sounds very romantic. Actually, what it does mean is you have to walk 30 minutes to get to your bus stop and you only get one bus a day, right? So that's the least romantic side. Uh, but I grew up there for 17 years. Um, nothing really happens on it, uh, but you do read loads because you know you can't do much else. My dad as a sport teacher had high ambitions for me to be a great surfer or kite surfer or wind surfer, which all fell miserably. So, um, and, and that's basically it. And it's very island leaving. Um, you, I had to cross to the mainland to go to high school because there's no high school where I come from. There's also no hospitals so actually giving birth. How do people survive? <laughs> well, there's now a bridge, uh, which helps substantially. Um, but, you know, actually, if you forget of giving birth, like the, you can't, commuting to your hospital is a whole different level um, in comparison of London. So I think I had 17 years. I think, you know, what's, what's, what I took from this, and I think it's a great strength, is I had to be full of imagination. I had to be full of creativity. I had to imagine loads of things because there was not much. Um, and I think you will see, but fast forward a few, you know, fast forward 10 years when we are imagining all those projects you know, they come from a child that just imagine stuff. Um, and I think I was good at imagining things out of very little. And um, and that's the way I remember fondly my childhood is that you just came up with stuff because it was not much. And whilst you were learning how to kite surf and <laughs> trying to get to badly. a hospital on the mainland <laughs> as a result of that, I assume, <laughs> what did the art market that kind of had their own life for centuries before you what was it like back back then yes i think it's you know it's first of all well, the, the art, art scene, market yeah. was such a abstract concept like you know you need to think that like i mean i'm sure some of you are from the countryside in the sense that like they are a type of jobs all those jobs are completely non-existent you don't even know they exist i think like I didn't even think art market at the time. For me, it was more thinking as I was reading loads and I was, and I'm a big reader. I was thinking all these people who have creative jobs that seems so interesting. And I just think like, where is that? Like, how can I get into, you know, basically all the people that we now know, like the entrepreneurs, the writers, the actors. Like, I was just fascinated by this as I was reading about them. Um, so I think it was like the art market was so would have been such a specialized terms. I was just only thinking in terms of creatives um, and how to get myself into that um, world of people. At the time, the art market would have been um, much more than now. I think most people would not have known what the art market would have been. When I, you know, when I was like, growing up, it was still something that Paris or London or pockets of New York would do, but very niche. I think luckily, as I started my career, the art market was actually opening it up. So. It's, um, I feel the timing in which it started is a lucky timing because, you know, if you think of public art, if you think of even brand collaboration, like Uniqlo uh, doing a brand collab with a Tate, all of these things are so recent that we are even aware um, that those things can be combined and, and the art world being open, like opening up is quite recent. So I clearly had a, was very lucky on the timing in which I entered the sector. I have two questions straight away follow up ones you say that you got inspired by cre the creative industries but you had absolutely as far as i understand n very little exposure no if any yes no clue. Uh, where you were living <laughs> i mean your role models would have been you know the kite surfers yeah. and windsurfers <laughs> yes. who are probably wonderful from where yeah, you're my come. dad and my cousins so do you remember <laughs> that uh, uh, <laughs> we did very well actually on that topic <laughs> 
so do you remember a point where you just was there a kind of a trigger or something that that inspired you just like this is what I want to do and you saw a movie maybe or yeah and was that sounded like really the most cliche romantic sentence uh, response um is a generally it's, I I love the 19th century uh, literature wise um art wise philosophically wise and you had all those um you had loads of books Flaubert Baudelaire which are more like French references where you had that microcosm of writers and poets and artists encountering um for dinners in Paris and I was really into um into that timing in literature and I was reading about that and I just you know my in a way I was seduced romantically by the idea of it before I even got to know the reality of what that was and so <laughs> to get my first intention a BBC culture show I wrote them a poem to give you how completely aside from the way things should have worked on why I wanted to be on the culture show. Uh, I think they thought I was mad, but they luckily said yes. Um, but it was fully a romantic um, vision of it. Um, but actually what's really nice is that I still had that romantic vision. I still talk to Martis thinking, those guys are incredible. Like obviously now I promise like there's structure in my company. I have some levels of pragmatism handling, but I do still think, wow, I mean, you've seen the video you know, with David Popeye, like literally walking on ice um, and painting on it. Like actually the romance hasn't gone. Like it's, they are incredible beings. Uh, so I don't think they were far from the books I was reading, obviously with a substantial amount of a steep learning curve in finance, um, you know, logistics and structure on how to back them. But actually the romance, is, the, the, the romance that I have towards what they are doing is still very much there. I'm talking about pragmatism and numbers. You say that the, the the art market and the art world was much smaller when you started out, and now it's yeah. much bigger. You know, you have yeah. brand collaborations. Yeah, huge. If we can put a number on it, like a lot of people like, what no. is what is what's the size so of the market? So sixty billion is for the art market, but actually, uh, which sounds like a big number, but to give you an idea, the fashion sector is one point five trillion. Um, so wow. like, it's it's to just give you proportions. Cause obviously, we're talking abstract and numbers, and it feels big. But actually, um, that's art market as in artworks that you're selling. Um, what I'm super proud of is we've opened up what it meant to be making money as an artist and also its audiences. So silly things like we have the public art suppliers of a Crown Estate or Westminster or Nigeria Estate here and many more. And that streams the revenues that will not be counted within those 60 billion. They'll be counted within um smart cities urban development place making or mm -hmm. they'll be counting within advertising for brand collaboration the digital market so we're actually tapping onto a way bigger sector than what it is um what is counted in that those 60 billion what, it's basically it you selling a painting um or the artist selling a painting or you reselling a painting it's very artworks driven our vision is like how can artists be much more core to society and how can what they do is, you know, integrates or inspire people at a much larger scale. Um, here you're looking at just the production of artworks within this figure. There is also a, an urban rumor <laughs> that... <laughs> Tell me. Um, half the galleries yes. in the world and half the art in the world exist solely for the purposes of money laundering. <laughs> I mean, Can you lot. comment on that? <laughs> I think, well, first of all, it's called the art world for a reason. It's not yet a professionalized sector. Um, something that drives us, you know, we're a B Corp. We very much run like a professionalized structure is to make sure our world gets professionalized because although it's romantic, it means uh, unless you know someone is very hard to get into it, it means there's no HR training, there is no... Um, you know, the opportunities, the way it's structured, it's it's very hard, I think, is the answer. And it also means on the talent side that you may be talented, um, you might not be able to strive through it. So I'm really on the side of how can we get this sector to be professional? How can we get it to be better structured? Um, so back to your question, therefore, because it's an art world, it's it, it lacks a lot of rules. Um, so when it lacks rules, it attracts people that probably will want to break them. Um, and something that you can do in the art world that, for instance, you can't do in the, the 
um, in the financial market will be inside the trading. So for instance, one of our artists um, is heading, is exhibiting at Gagosian on the 16th of March, which is number one gallery in the world. We knew about this before, obviously, because we manage this carrier. So we can tell our clients, do buy now. Um, now, if you do this in the business world, like this is criminal. You go to prison. Yes. <laughs> If Supposedly. you do this in my world, you get your clients really excited and my clients are very happy because they have bought his works for substantially less like I was only selling them at, right? So it's it's it, that's to give you that the rules are still very different. Um, and just like what we've seen in crypto and, and those are places where like realistically there is a need for regulations, there are gaps um, which allow for, I'm sure, money laundering. Now, it's definitely changing because we have KYC that we have to clear for every cell. Um, and again, in our structure, frankly, we wouldn't take it. Uh, it will be it will be reputation damaging. Um, it would undermine everything else that we're doing, especially because we do loads of B2B. Um, so I do think it's in pockets of it. Um, and I do think people are very much at it. Like, um, I, I think it's gonna be harder and harder to do over the coming years, in case you want to do it, I would do it as early as possible because I think it's about to get harder. Um, so I, I think it's changing is the answer. I think I read somewhere that uh, the art market is the largest unregulated yeah, industry it is. It is. in the world. It well, Because it is not yet a, an industry. It's think that two thirds of galleries are not profitable and that most, you know, like uh, Chris's and Sotheby's are still status symbol for it's a billionaire's game right it's um so this is why again it's so important to bring something that will have audiences at large to educate people at large also because by the second you have large audiences you need regulations if you just have a basically a network of high net worth this is a very different game mm -hmm. um and i think it's um, this is a big part of what we're trying to do, but it will, you know, you're still looking at a network of try high net worths. Um, it's very changing, but that's so much what you're looking at. So we've discussed the art scene a bit, and but coming back again um, to history, <laughs> um, how did you end up in London, and how did you join? So I did the art market here. That's <laughs> the story. <laughs> Um, I don't want you to think it's the dark market because I love my sector and I think there's so much opportunities in making it different. So don't come away with this. And why did evening. you join, so to say? <laughs> I, um, so I studied literature, philosophy in France. I did two years. Um, I double dropped out. So two years in France and two years at Warwick University, the history of art. So it's a double drop, four years to a tool. Um, I was told that out of that degree in France, I could become a politician or professor. I didn't want to do either of that. Um, with full respect to anyone who is a professor or politician. Um, and I was told that the UK was a place where it didn't really matter what you studied. You could reinvent yourself or you could at least take on a new job or you know, you could study philosophy and for instance, do a law conversion or to do go into business. And, and it was a time where I was like, I just don't know yet what I'm going to, what job I'm going to do and I'm going to set myself on the creative scene. So the UK felt that like the support is where it was more work experience related and you could just constantly learn and strive and, and hopefully get the job that you want. Um, so that's the reason I, I, I decided to change countries. And also France was telling me that it, it, would, it will take six, seven years of studies plus work experience. So I, should I will probably just start a job at 25, 26 years old. I like the fact that a country could start earlier. I was keen to get started, Philip. Um, and the UK was telling me I could get started earlier. Um, Much earlier than Europe, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly, and that was exciting. Like, in a weird way, I'm now the person that's like, love learning, studying, like all of the things that you know. But it just as a young, um, as a as a teenager and young twenties, I just wanted to get started. I want to get, get you want to understand how things worked. Um, and that is what I love. I applied to UBC, got that internship, was lucky to meet my first boss, um, Andrew Laberty, on a TV show at the time. And straight away was put on a fair to kind of help selling works, which I had absolutely no clue about and whose values were completely mad because the fair was called the pad on Berkeley Square. Um, but I loved it. Like, this is a thing with the UK. You just get sent stuff, like, and it's just you grab it and you're totally clueless. And I was researching on Artnet, which was such a 
weird looking website at the time trying to comprehend what I was actually talking about. Um, but I think, yeah, that was much more my way of learning. It was full on intense. You just have to strive. And I love that. Well, the UK is definitely the the land of opportunities and change. I mean, you can get a person who first studied um, economics and um, now hosting a, a talk show. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. Um, so now we've um, arrived at um, at MT Art. What is MT Art Agency? So MT Art is the first talent agency in the art world. Um, so. Like you were saying earlier, I was, after all this peripacies, was lucky to be chosen by an investor in Los Angeles when I was running a gallery here in London to co-own a gallery in Los Angeles. I got sent to LA at 23 and I had no idea what celebrity world looks like, the entertainment world. Like, you know it better than I, but I was like, I'd never dreamed of it. I never dreamed of LA. It was such a foreign way of thinking. Um, and I landed into the machines that creates reputations and basically celebrity. And and I was finding that really interesting. And it was actually the rise of Kim Kardashian, which I have nothing against, because it became like a big part of our story. But I was just like, my guys and the artists I love working with have so much content they can offer. And they're in art worlds where, you know, if I just ask you when we walked down the street, like, do you know this artist or this artist? You will have no clue and that's totally fair because our, our sector is so crap at inspiring people at a large scale. And then on the other side, it was like seeing these machines, that those talent agencies in Hollywood that were building so much um, reputation and like reach of audiences. And I was like, I want that for them because I think that's super inspiring. Um, so that really inspired me. I thought I'm going to borrow the talent agency model, which doesn't exist in my sector, bring it back to London, which I did. Um, and then we became the first talent agency um, in the art world. And, and, and it is exactly that. So it's just how do we get those people, you know, it sounds silly, like, um, but for instance, I always cry on my key adverts. I'm so sorry, this is that embarrassing. I found it every time really moving how those athletes just like rock through and just like on like pay through every challenge. I see those guys are the same. And I just always felt like I just want people to see that. Like I see my I see like our talents are like overcoming challenges and pressure and then rethinking how they're positioned and inspiring people. And I was like, I just somehow want to transfer that because that's the way I see them. So I took all of this with me and then this is what we try to do. But before uh, there was a talent agency for artists. Yes. Th that function was mostly done by the gallery, the, the galleries, right? So the galleries would never put, so that's really interesting. When we, um, so my lovely man is a VC, as you know, cause you know Will very well. Um, and he, uh, the VC world was just starting at the time, putting the faces of their funders on websites, saying we back people with a great vision. We, galleries will never put the face of the artist because it was seen as like, you should concentrate on the artwork. So we were actually really criticized when we started because I just put their big faces in their studio on my website like a VC would do. Because I just want to say we back them. This is them that we back, not just the works. We back the full person that the artist is. So the gallery was re is really a retail that concentrates on artworks. That's a big difference versus like a talent agency that is very much like talent backing, artist backing. Um, and and you know, now obviously like it's changing, the market has changed drastically. Like, you know, MTV just is now doing a show, revealing the top artists, like all of this has completely changed. And that conversation was relevant eight years ago. Now my market has evolved in our direction, which is very lucky. But it's to give you an idea that like, you would actually not really know who the artists were. Even when the solo exhibition will be launched, the artists might not be there. Like, you know, the salespeople will be talking directly to the collectors. We just wanted the artists to be right in the center. And we wanted people to hear how incredible those people were. That is a, a, indeed a very big change because before, whether it was created by um, the galleries or the museums, it was always thought that artists were represented by their paintings, by their art, by their yeah. sculpture, right? And it didn't really matter, there was this debate about, uh, it didn't really matter who the person behind it was, yeah. as long as a good person, a bad person, with a good reputation or a bad reputation, as long as the art is amazing 
or popular or whatever other criteria you use um i think was that really uh, was do you think that's uh, the wrong way to go do you think it's uh, because in the film world right um the reason we see the faces on all the websites and imdb and things because essentially the actors produce work with their face yes. so to say we that's who we who we see in the movies it's but we very rarely see artists faces in their paintings yeah, but I so I don't think it's wrong or right because I think I want to stand off like um, whether it's like you know I find right or wrong like very divisive and very moral driven as a question where it's you know if you want to just only look at artworks just only look at artworks um, I think for me I believe that people are inspired by people um, and in reality like going back to the Nike advert like. I'm not into tennis, but Sarah and I Williams just comes across incredibly. And she's a role model whether or not you want to go and play tennis the next morning. And um, she becomes a role model to many people that goes beyond the sport she's ultimately um, representing. Um, I see them again as role models. Um, and beyond whether or not you're going to take on sculpture or painting, it's just the fact that they are inspiring beings. And I think, yes, the actors obviously use their face and act in movies, but they're also role models for a lot of them. They stand, they're going to inspire you beyond, again, what you whether you were seen there in a movie or not. And same with founders, like this is why there's, we always get interested about who built what companies wise. Like, you know, every founder story is really incredible and in how they've gone about it. So I do think we are interested deep down by people's stories. Um, and it's very hard for someone who has never entered the art world to get directly interested by the object, um, which of course is possible, but I think it's hard. Um, whereas I think being pulled in with the story of the person who created it is a nice way emotionally to also connect to then hopefully diving into the, the paintings a lot more. So I just find it easier um, at large to get people connected. Back again to my example with Serena Williams, whether or not you just know loads about tennis, you can relate to her as a person, obviously not relate as in, will never be as posh as achieved, but more that you can connect emotionally with who she is. Right. And, but delving a bit deeper in how you then work, and how it's different to the gallery. Sure, you yes. do, you focus more on uh, on the personality and on the person, and looking at um, his or her you know, um, life and inspiration. Um, but structurally, how does it work? I mean, um, the galleries we know that you they get you exclusive rights to certain works, and then they PR the works and they exhibit them all around the world, and then they sell them, and then they take a, a fee, yeah. right, or what percentage or something. Um, I assume the your agency works more like the CAs and the UTAs yeah. of the world. So it's two, I mean, basically two rooms, two completely different atmospheres. You walk into a gallery, as you know yourself, you will usually encounter a receptionist that would, tends to not be that warm on purpose because she wants or he wants to identify whether or not you can spend enough money. So it's all built to make you feel a little bit crap and it's exclusive. And we're just going to really work out, because I've been part of that world, whether or not you can spend, right? So this is our objective into that experience. So it's a bit cold, It's you don't know how easy. And only someone with a substantial amount of knowledge and confidence can therefore work this room on purpose, right? Um, with no judgment attached is how it's built. Um, the Titan Agency world is completely the opposite. It's a Jerry Maguire for the ones who are old enough to have watched it. Always to call my agent on Netflix for the one younger uh, to have watched that reference. But it's busy, it's dynamic. Like even if you've, done, if never, if you've never walked into a Titan Agency uh, per se, you may have walked into an advertising agency like an Amasachi and Noses and you walk in as there's people running around and it feels dynamic and exciting and 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 you have much more that sense that like there's a creative thread that's just running through it, right? First of all, because you have very different types of people, in a gallery setup, the works is already produced and you have a sales type again back on a retail level that's going to pitch this work and sell them. Basically, in our job, we have to like create a lot of those ideas for our artists. So um, okay. we will be like, this is a square, let's just reinvent it. Um, and we have to position which artist is going to do that, who is going to reinvent it, how can we rethink that square? Um, so my guys are much more creative. Like the director of my public art uh, department 
the director of my brand partnership department are deep creatives. They have to, they can't just come up with, we have the perfect artwork to place there. It's, it's a whole creative thinking. So it's going to attract different people. There's dynamism that comes with it. And I wanted that feeling, which I so love with CA, that you walk into this space as a talent and you're like, those guys are really exciting. I would like to work with them. So it's a sense of excitement as you walk in that I just wanted to convey. So your creative team actually works directly with the artists, suggesting yep. So you have a director of art sales, you have a director of brand partnerships, creative agency, public art. Ultimately, you have people who are constantly pitching the works of talents that we work with, which are now 48 talents total. Um, And you pitch all day. Like you're very much, this is why I'm saying court my agents, like you are constantly pitching um, for your artists to get the top deals. And, but you are having to be very creative with it because you can't just say, here's an artwork. Like, a lot of the times, you know, like our most recent big projects, so Raven is in her mid twenties and she just closed the six figure projects for uh, three sculptures that are not yet created, are tackling a very difficult topic in history. And um, this takes a huge amount of creativity to be able to put together as a deal, right? So um, when we did the World Cup back in November, we, were, we worked with Hyundai, which was one of the main sponsors of the World Cup. We had to work on the advertising campaign, the digital side, and also the, you know, the fan base side of the public art. So it's it's a very different job. It's much more what a Universal will be up to and what a CA will be up to than, than your gallery setup. Might there be a risk, though, if you have a, your creative theme, uh, yeah. team looking at the trends and what sells and what uh, people engage with and then relay that to the artists under your management, might that kill originality in the works? So I think a nozo agency can do that um because our mission is to break a type of content we think is historical add values to the sector we wouldn't be driven by that like again as a b corp um raven d clark who i mentioned who's just won that six figure projects um the topic is slavery we are so proud that we're going to break this at a high level of audiences uh, is a really difficult commission. You will see, I can't reveal much about that, but it's a really difficult commissioning in terms of that process. Um, what's uh, driving my team forward is to actually bring an intellectual content at large. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that, I think that's ultimately the preference of a, uh, of a team versus another. It's not our drive. Our drive is to reveal their visions. It's not about us, um, but we want to make sure people get and engage with their visions and people just get inspired by what they brought for, bring forward. Now, I know the talent agency can decide that, but that is definitely not our decision. Right, talking about figures that yes. you mentioned. Uh, in the last question, there's been a lot of six figures and things. I have yes. a 35 million dollar question for you. Yes, I know the one you're going to ask me. So in your official bio on your websites and yes. your releases, um, um, you put that your company is now worth 35 million. Yes, which is not in my bank account by all means. Uh, sadly. <laughs> um, but it's worth 35 million. And yes. in a world, and the art world is weird this way because we have the creatives uh, that are generally, in general, yeah. um, liberal, more on the left side of the sector, less capitalistic. Yeah. And then you have the buyers who are usually right-wing capitalist. Yeah. And then, so, and also, but your mission statement is, says that you're democratizing the yeah. um, art world and uh, that uh, you are shying away from the, making it less elitist. Yeah. Yet you write about 35 yeah, million dollars and, um, you know, this investor and that investor and that capitalist and that capitalist coming across your website, might there be a, a bit of a confusion in the so is wording everyone, there? Is everyone aware of what a B Corp is before I start answering? Do you all know what a B Corp stands for? Okay, so I'm going to explain first the B Corp so I can answer your question. B Corp was started by um, the Patagonia founder. I don't know if you know the company Patagonia, but they one of the top selling products at the time was sadly harming the environment. So he decided to remove his top selling product um, because you thought that doesn't go with our values, which was a big economy called coup. And then that kind of inspired something called B Corp. You might sit on quite a few companies now, um, but it's basically 
the fact that you are, yes, a company. So the goal of a company is economics. You need to make sure your companies thrive, but you do it with values. Um, it's very hard to get uh, to become a B Corp. You get 3,000 accepted for 100,000 applying every year. Um, and you have 90 pages of admin, which drive my team crazy, which is all across your HR, your socials, everything, and how you run as business. We are completely a big corporate in that thinking, and she was your question. 90% um, of my sector is from people who have inherited wealth. I haven't. Um, this completely shapes how talent or opportunities are provided. So, you know, if you don't start empowering people economically, then it, it, it will reinforce the fact that if you don't talk about money, the ones who are ultimately have inherited wealth will strive. Um, Raven that I mentioned was six figure. I put it everywhere. She had one that six figure contract because she's specifically not from a background of wealth. Um, she's black minority and that just breaks the odds and defies the odds on so many level uh, for the sector I'm in. So for me, her economical success is also a success that is social because it means that as she gets empowered, she can empower others. And when you're in a sector specifically run by um, a lot of elitism, it's important to make sure that access to wealth, access to finance and is democratized because otherwise you can't change who is going to succeed. You can have the same people at the top professionally, you can have the same people in terms of talents who are going to succeed. So it's it's a, it's it's I understand how it could look confusing. But for us, it's not. Um, it is specifically, we believe that the economical empowerment is going to mean that the diversity of who comes into the sector is going to get wider. And we already have shown that through the diversity of our portfolios of artists and through who is part of our team. Separately from this, um, as a founder who's very idea-driven, I just love that my idea has value. Um, it's obviously, like, this is why I mentioned it's not in my bank account, but I just like that this idea, which sounded so mad, which was so highly criticized and under attack when it started, uh, has now got value. It's, it's, um, it's a pride that we all hold as part of our C-suite team, that we can make an idea worth something, especially when you're actually uh, driven by the mission that the idea uh, stands for. So um, look up B Corp because it, it can, like economics can be um, can be the change. They can ultimately be uh, triggering social change, especially um, when you're in a network of people who um, come from so many privileges, economical privileges. Does that sound convincing? <laughs> yes, I think um, I think what well, uh, well, I've been analyzing everything about your business and what you're doing. I think what you're doing really well is that you are marrying and including those two worlds together both the, the you know the capitalistic the, the more wealthy class together with the creative which is great i think that's um i see you as a, a kind of a, a manager of those two worlds at the same time yeah i mean you have to again as a b corp like there's you know we talk about money laundering there are things you definitely wouldn't be touching there are uh, types of projects or contracts you would not go nearby. Obviously, we couldn't work with a shell. Like, there's loads of things that would just be, no, you can't do that. Um, but I do believe in having everyone in the same room. Um, I'm a big believer in that culturally. I think the expect nature of, of us both means that, like, I want everyone at the table. Um, and, and if I can make everyone around the table work, then I'm excited to have everyone work together ultimately. And that's a big deep down, that's my personality. So it's also the reason why probably we be, we're able to build all those divisions that can think differently about the role of the artist is because I just believe again in the value of people thinking differently in the same room. Um, talking about um, saying no, I'm very interested in finding out how you select your artists. You said that you have 40. Yeah. 48. What does the process look like? So we get a lot of applications is the answer because we actually also partially contribute to studio costs and production costs of our talents. Um, so we, um, at this stage, there's definitely a lot of demand. Um, I think it's, I'm going to, I'm going to counter your, your question and say, how do I say yes before? How do I say no? Um, I think the, back to the Nike advert, um, it's, it takes a lot for someone to, have that level of how they're going to handle pressure, that determination, that unique vision, that unique voice, those values. And actually like, it's very rare. It's it's rare in, in that you encounter it. You get tremendously excited. You know, we spoke about Raven earlier, like I just saw her 
three years ago and I just remember that coffee meeting I had with her and I was like, oh, that person is going to be amazing. And you have it because you, you sense that like the way that they look at the world, the way that they express it, the way that they, the generation comes through is so unique that you just want to be behind it. Um, so that's on the yes side. And actually the yes is quite easy. Usually the whole team gets super excited and, and you just, you've, you've got the, you feel privileged to be working with that person at whatever level of the career. Um, the no, therefore, is something that is tough because the truth is that you end up saying more no than yes. Um, I think as we all get older, we we handle better saying no. I think because it's just it's a really great skill set, but it's tough to say no. I think you you know if someone has put their entire life on the line to do something that's incredibly brave, like it's, it's just not an easy thing to do. But I think you learn to do it by being helpful, by giving tips by um by hopefully providing still a way that is human to do it um but it's because those guys are so exciting that you that you have to say no here um you can't compromise in the middle you've got to stay true to why why you're doing the, the thing that you're doing and you we're doing that because we want those special talents to strive uh, so therefore we have every month to say no a lot and that is always going to be the the tough part of the job do you have a selection committee or do you do it by yourself? So my, it's definitely not me, um, but we do have now full metrics that enable us, you know, the, the, there's a way to think about it because I'm in a relationship with one is, is the VC side where we are very clear now about the metrics we want to see into an artist. Now, again, those are not metrics like that person walks in with a business cards and they have a perfect pitch deck because as you can imagine, my artists don't even know what a pitch deck is. Um, it's more like, you know, technically, like how do they innovate? Like how do they conceptually position themselves? Like how do they, the nature of their vision, like the voice, the stylistic, there's loads and loads and loads of things that we are looking at um, and that we're confident now selecting upon. Um, so there are loads of criterions is the answer. And then you kind of take a vote. Yeah. Um, and I will never say who, but therefore there are people within the agency, it's not my taste. Um, taste is completely irrelevant. It's really about building a portfolio of unique voices. So obviously I can't tell you, but it just, there are people that just, I don't, it's not my taste, but they're incredibly successful and I adore them as people. So how do you make, uh, make sure that diversity happens? So did, did, does if everyone in your kind of selection committee get a one person that they could, can take I think, in? Well, first without of all, you go through a voting system, but second, because you're not looking at taste, a taste is quite a taste is quite biased, sadly, because obviously you get informed by what you've seen previously, um, and I'm sure there's there's a lot of romanticism around the eye of a dealer, and I have encountered a few art dealers who generally have the most incredible eyes. So I think this happens on the zero dot zero one percent chance, but overall taste, apart from that, is very biased. It's ultimately everything that you've seen has shaped what you're going to think is great, right? So by putting clear metrics and criterions it, it hopefully get rid as much as you can of biases which is back to diversity if you look at our portfolio you just get over 17 nationalities you get a complete mix of gender which is really rare for the sector and completely different uh, uh, again of social ba social backgrounds and uh, that's because we're criterion based and we're not taste based. Um, and that's the reason why we can have all those debates of conversations. Can you share some criteria roughly? Because yeah, I what, where, where does taste finish and criteria start? I think for, for instance, conceptually, um, it will be, let's say you are tackling um, circular economy as a topic within your works, right? We would want to know how, how is it that you're tackling it? So as in, are you adding value to artists who previously discussed the topic? So how are you adding value conceptually to this? Um, what's the angle that you're taking that's very much you? How How is that thinking very different to something that we've encountered? Then technically it will be the same. Like you're just, you know, like David Popaz, for instance, created his own biodegradable pigments um, to paint. And again, this unique style in painting. So there's loads of ways in which you can vouch for uniqueness. 
Um, and again, uniqueness is a big term. Of course, you, you've always been inspired by someone somewhere, but the way they've all combined it makes their voice very strongly different from anything you've seen before. Uh, and that's what's exciting for us to push. Okay, talking about it more broadly, um, we, when we go to see a movie, we usually come out and we say, well, this is a good movie, or this is a bad movie. And then we go and we listen to an artist, um, a musical artist, and we say, well, we enjoy it. And it's, yeah. it's a, you know, it's a great rock artist. What makes a good artist? Well, opinion? I think this is, a, this is the, way you're handling, the way you're asking the questions is from all of us going to a movie. That's very different to how within the sector you will assess the quality of the movie, right? So this is how you have to divide that question. How do we assess it? In well, I think in the art world, you know, you traditionally has been going through taste and through trends, like you mentioned. So let's say the YBAs with Damien Hirst and Tracy. I mean, you know, there's an emerging art scene in the UK. Uh, it was about being provocative. So Damien Hirst obviously put the shark cut it in half. Uh, Chris Ophelia put literally poo on the canvas, like provocation. It was a time of Charles Satchi. Charles Satchi as an advertiser was all about provocation and that's, and, and they will go around theme or they will go around movement. So that's traditionally how it's run. In a very uh, globalized world, it's much harder to see those trends, which is why it's good for us because it's now to do with how great the talent is separately to pockets in the UK, pockets in like, you see that a lot less because people travel all the time and it's just, there's the blend of culture finally is happening much more. So I think, I think our way of looking at things, which is to review upon criteria and a talent is becoming more mainstream uh, within the art world. And that's to line up how innovative they are technically, how conceptually they're looking at something, like, you know, what new, fresh look they, they they are bringing to the sector etc but traditionally up to a point it was Charles Satchi because he was very wealthy backing a few guys those few guys becoming massive Nicolas Serota opening the tape model at the same time and then those guys basically just doing things together right but I think that's changing because the world is completely opening up on our sector and obviously those this doesn't really exist in the same way there's a degrees of influence that can that can obviously always encourage a career but it's you don't have that sense of movement that is very geolocalized that way. But all um, all that you've mentioned is still, to me, a bit vague. So when we, whenever we, we think of something that's good or bad or mediocre, there's a scale, right? Yeah. So, for example, in the film world, yeah, um, we have we can evaluate a movie. On based on IMDb ratings, which is a number, yeah, good or bad, yeah. or the box office numbers, good, you know, a billion dollars is good, one million dollars is bad for a movie, yeah, or we can evaluate um, by the number of awards or by the number of critical, uh, you know, cr what the critics say, and those things might not coincide. Same thing with in the art world. So what what makes good art? Is it what the critics say is it what the I mean, museums say is it how much question. it sells like yeah but i think that's a big that? question i mean the same in the film world like is it more important for you to ultimately have all the critics side or do you have a larger audiences and make the biggest amounts of money like is it an avatar or is it more like a can festival on a specific topic it's that would always that's you know that's almost a decision of the talent himself or herself like I have talents like Lorenzo Queen who did the World Cup and who did maybe you saw those big hands the Venice Viali. Yeah, yeah. Um it's obviously gone for a career where it's all to do with incredibly large audiences um, he's not going to be thinking in the same way that some of my other talents will going to be thinking I want to be really on that topic for 10 years and then I'm just going to get the top art critic on the FT to write about it so I think that it's impossible to answer that question because it's strategically a very different career and there's space and room for all that types of careers now on ratings I think it's way harder to do a rating system unless the sector doesn't get much larger audiences but it will come. Already you see it just through social media that the fact that an artist will only have tons more likes than another's is a way of rating for who is most popular or not. But you're still in a sector that is opening up. So you don't have, of course, like the, the movie rating of 
you know, I liked it, I didn't like it, etc. But it's coming, I think social media is only helping that on people being able to judge more directly whether or not they like a talent, uh, but you're not at the same level of audiences that like the movie world will, will see through. Well, the, the, um, the level and the, the criteria is what the artists judge themselves by, whether it's, you know, sales or independently working and have critics liking them. Use a talent uh, agent, yeah. essentially. What do you direct them towards, or or what do you feel yourself? Well, I think that's what exactly. Is the most it, it, I, their strategy is theirs, in the sense that we have to execute a strategy, but who they want to become is up to them. Um, some of my talents like care enormously about the art critic level. For them, the museum, the art critic is number one goal. Uh, but like I said, some of those just don't. Like they want to inspire millions of people, and it's like. You know, like it's about like who is going to enable to do that. My job and the job of my team is to make sure that the success they hope for, we go and get it. Um, and from our from our end, we just get the the intellectual stimulation to build a portfolio of people whose successes are going to be very different, yet very complementary because I just get to shape very different types of career. But ultimately. Um, this is this is their is this their call like if um if they want to if what's most important to them is how much money they're going to earn and how much commercial sushi they're going to have then it's ultimately my obligation to go and get that if, if otherwise it's because they care about the critic choice then it's our job again to go and get it they lead it right okay as a business you would probably encourage all of your um kind of artists to not only think about Art you critics. Know, art critics, but more think about the, the general population or your buyers for that matter. Well, as well. the good news is to that answer again is that someone that goes very commercially is going to give you a regular amount of brand partnerships or public art uh, that you're making money on. And so on a monthly basis, that's like regular cash flow. Someone that's going for the art critic, their work could be half a million at Chris's and Sotheby's in mm -hmm. five to six years' time. So financially, you can find yourself in it as a business. You just have different timings for it. Um, in the same way that as a business, you can decide to make it a lifestyle business where you have cons constant cash flow. You can say like, I am all about disrupting on the specific element and I'm just building up with no cash flow until we become the lead one, right? There's different ways to create success again. The good news on building a portfolio is that you are just building different timings. Um, but I mentioned Azico was going off to Gagosian. That's fantastic uh, on a on a level of pricing. Um, it, somebody else that would just be doing recurrent brand partnerships, like a Claire Luxon, is just as relevant in that portfolio. So for us, it doesn't matter. We just need to be aware of the timing. They need to be aware of the timing. Um, and because it's a portfolio, I'm just very comfortable with people having different timelines um, because I believe in them again as, as talents. You also mentioned that the, f the future of the art world might involve social media. Well, I'm the most, um, uh, the happiest about social media. I actually just read an article this week that said, you know, social media really gets bad press and, um, and how the people who are the happiest about social media are the one that ultimately communicate and interact with people and use it as a communication tool, which is totally me. Like social media, LinkedIn or Instagram has enabled us as a business to strive, but also has made tons of connection. Like I always remember when with Will we were landing in uh, in Israel, going to Jerusalem and the random follower texts me saying, my dad is a creator there and we just got to see all the behind the scenes of that collection of that museum like through a connection so i love connection i love community building i love all of that that you can get from social media and um, for the first time i got to see a dark side of it in october um which again shows my um shows my luck probably to have not experienced it like before that um but basically was uh, sadly the victim of a cyberbullying campaign. Everything you can think of from, um, I had slept with all Martin investors. Our first son was not the one of, uh, of our relationship. Um, it, they were targeting my employees and artists. It was just the most delightful um, few weeks. I saw you on that first weekend. It was absolutely delightful. Um, I mean, I smiled because uh, I, we were talking about it just before and it's it was hell there's no other way to describe it it's violent it's hell it's uh, personal and sadly 
um, on a female founder level, it's every cliche in the book that you could potentially have. You know, you're the witch, you're the slut, you're all of this. And it's disturbing because it's main level of sexism that you know exists and suddenly you just get um, projected onto you. Um, I think the reason I smile is because I am incredibly fortunate and that's what we discussed. Um, as much as obviously I went through hell, in reality, um, my support system of friends, my relationship, my staff, my artists all stepped up is the answer. Um, no employees, everyone stayed. Um, I mean, the artists, it was incredible. Like they were all photographing themselves next to us and specifically endorsing us in that time because all these things really just go really fast. Uh, but there's a violence of it that is very um, traumatizing. Um, my employees were targeted uh, with some of them with pictures on it by those trolls. Um, but again, st stood really strongly. Um, and, you know, as much as obviously, maybe that's my very optimistic nature, but you could look at it as um, this is a very dark event, or you could look at it thinking, actually, how incredible that everyone stood up um, and that that support system organized itself. This shows our strengths as a business. This shows our unity as a team, as a unity of artists. Um, now, of course, it makes me extra vocal, uh, extra vocal about the fact that like, only 2% of women succeed to raise funding. If on the top of this, we get extra backlashes, as you can imagine, um, it's not really great on the numbers side of things, talking about numbers. Um, the sexism is very much there. I'm sure we all know in this room that it's there. Um, does it stop us? No. I think, you know, it's, it's done to silence you and it's definitely not going to silence us is the answer. It's also done to signal that, you know, I was pregnant at the time um, and it's almost done to signal that maybe a woman can't have it all. And I'm sure maybe you're familiar with that headline from BC News on the uh, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda re resigning a few weeks ago with BBC News asking, can women really have it all? Which is incredibly shocking coming out of the Singapore office of BBC. Um, this is a classic example of maybe s signaling to a woman, you can't have it all. Um, so that other women don't try and have it. But the truth is, like, I will continue to uh, build the copy that I'm doing. And we are lucky that, therefore, we will stand pride. This happened two months after the Sunday Times listed us as one of the fastest growing copy in the UK with um, nothing to be ashamed of. We, we should continue. Um, and it made me, as a company, uh, tremendously more resilient. Um, so there's a lot of pride that comes with that as a team on how well we've done through that. Um, now, what I would say is this came to me at 33 years old where I could afford for a good lawyer, where I could afford um, a support system as well. Um, you do this to a 20 years old, this could collapse that person mentally. Um, my advice to anyone in this room is if you see an act of bullying happening, just do stop it. Don't, si don't just watch in silence. I think there's that human thing whether so something happens on the bus and suddenly someone gets written down or the cyber bullying that everyone just waits and is silent. Don't wait and silent, reach out to the person, ask if they're okay emotionally. Ultimately, if that happened to me younger, I could have collapsed mentally. And that is what we want to try and avoid with the cyber bullying cases, because this is a happy story because I'm old enough to have that support system. The company is about to be eight years old and we're solid enough to go through it. But you do this to someone younger and they, they, they potentially can't make it. And that is, that is damage in a society that we're not trying to, you know, stand in the way of this a lot more. Um, it's sadly too common. Well, you've um, been quite vocal about social media in, uh, over the past, you know, years. And um, in, in general, I, I remember you saying that uh, Kim Kardashian had more <laughs> followers <laughs> than the Louvre. Poor Kim. I uh, really have nothing against Kim. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's uh, is the, the social. It, so why is social media um, the future of art? If if it is, because it is, it, it it's not the most hospitable place, as we know. And <laughs> you in, even did a, a bit of an experiment where you uh, uh, posted uh, photos of, of you know backsides, and that got more. Yeah, so uh, to take a step back. Yes, um, <laughs> uh, likes than you know artwork. I'm very, so not to boast, but I have um, written a book that's coming up with Penguin 
coming up next January 2024 oh, wonderful. called On the Impact of Visuals. Our belief, again, as a company is that you get up in the morning and you consume visuals from what you see on your phone to advertising to what's on your street, and that shapes you. Um, think about like the number of images you've seen from this morning to now, um, whether they're commercials or not, like how this could influence what you want to consume, what you want to be, where you, all of this. So we want to bring awareness on the fact that this is, if you consume a certain type of images too much, this can make you think like, I need to look a certain way, I need to be a certain way. And, and that awareness is very key. Not to change, again, if you want to become a King Kardashian, become King Kardashian, but to be aware that this may be the type of content that you are over-watching for a few hours a day, and that could therefore really shape how you feel as a person. Uh, so it's less about scheme, more about the content. Um, and I think back to, so yes, as a, an experiment, just after I got the Forbes, I posted a picture of myself in a bikini, and that got substantial, obviously, more attention um, than the Forbes. And this was to say that Again, as a young girl, if you get more complimented on your body in a bikini than your Forbes, this is kind of going to influence you partially to post more bikini pictures, right? Um, and so it's just also being us aware on the on the common side. If we're only commenting on our girlfriends when um, they're posting bikini pictures less on their professional achievement, that's also going to probably influence what they're going to see of themselves. So just the awareness is not to, it's fine. If you think your girlfriend is cute in a bikini picture, I have nothing against that. It's just more the overload of a certain type of content versus another. And and I think this is again, social media is just all us, all of us being in the same room and a bit like in Roman times with a lot of noise and we are all talking. That is ultimately social media. You can make anything out of it. I think that's what I mean. It's like David Papa is on social media and inspires thousands of people when he makes public art on ice. Like that is social media. But yes, you also have cyberbullying that's part of it. You also have and that the shaming side, which is much more what you would have in this kind of like amphitheater of the public opinion, right? Um, this is basically us to make it what we want it to be. We just happen to all be in that room together. So for my when visually, we're just saying, are you aware of where you're making it as a place? Um, it's it's more, are you aware where you consume visually content-wise, where you endorse content-wise? Again, if you're aware of it and that's what you want to endorse, go for it. But if you're not aware of it, um, then that's the problematic of it because where, where it's leading, it, it is worrying because it is a place where uh, the you know, you see much more of a content like a Kim Kardashian provides more than you will see what Le Louvre provides. And that is, I, I'm asking the questions on whether that is what we want to see. Um, and I think we are not realizing that we're shaping it. We think it's it's just there, but it's not just there, it's shaping our society. Well, it's just, is it just that the Louvre and the museums have, you know, a l less knowledge of the social media world and worse, talent in, ma in, manage in managing it, I mean the social media, you know. Well, I think our, our world has been crap inspiring people because we haven't been opening the doors wide to people, obviously, so there's a blame to put on that. But it's also the fact that, um, you know, we have seen consuming content as something very passive, part of the entertainment world, not something that actually matters. So we, you know, I, we all have long days at work. It's easier to switch on something that just makes us feel a bit like I can chill and just do tons of things and look at my phone at the same time. And actually taking a content that's really gonna be intellectually challenging, right? All of us go through those phases, I completely get it. But this is what I mean about, let's just try to temper it down. And I think the, the TED talk I gave on that topic is called visual diets. It's a bit saying, it's fine to eat a McDonald's every now and then. Do you really want to have five hours of it every day? Like it's, the, all I'm just asking is awareness, like, and and the conscious of where you're digesting every day visually, um, with the no judgment whatsoever towards um, how you go about it. But I think right now people are not realizing that they are constantly absorbing a content that I think is really affecting them. Maureen, thank you. Before we move on to our Q&A, I have compiled a list of very short answer questions for you. So basically, kind of yes and no. Um, first question. NFT art, is it a scam? No. Is Jeff Koons a great artist? Yes. Will 
Banks's identity it's tough be? Because there's gonna be so many like questions after this. Yes. Like, like my team is literally like probably we watch it's been like, oh, you can't just say that. But yes, you asked me yes and no, so that's the game. Uh, will uh, <laughs> Banksy's real identity be revealed? Um, no, publicly, but internally, we all know. Yes, so I think it depends on the internal and external. That's a difficult publicly. one. Publicly, publicly, in the future. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, National Gallery or Tate Modern? Uh, Tate Modern. Freeze or Art Basel? Art Basel. Damon Hurst or Tracy Eamon? Tracy Eamon. London or Paris? London. <laughs> and what's the single next big thing in art? The single next big thing? Um, well, I think I do. I think it will be the art world becoming the art sector. And I can't wait for that. That would be very exciting. Maureen, thank you so much.